Remember what happened to the fleet after World War I? Our ships and gear were laid up with heavy coatings of preservatives, and yet they rusted, and costly equipment became useless. sometimes six months were needed to get these ships back in condition. Thus, when World War II broke out, the fleet was not ready. But through hard work against time, these ships and hundreds of new ones were added to the active fleet. Until today, we have the world's greatest fleet. What to do with it? It would be a pretty good idea to have it around, ready for unpredictable future needs. But let's be realistic. A nation at peace, spending most of its money for peacetime purposes, not to maintain a big fleet. And the men who would man those ships, working at peaceful arts and skills. How, under these circumstances, can we keep the fleet ready for a possible blitz war? That's our problem. In a general way, the solution is to keep the ships and work out a method of keeping them with the fewest men and least money. Of course, a few of them can be scrapped, but only the obsolete ones. A great many remain, good ships, worth hanging on to. These good ships will be divided between active and inactive fleets. The active ships will have two tasks. Some will make up the regular navy, Others will be used primarily for training purposes. The rest of the ships will be the inactive fleet. Ships will move from the active fleet to the inactive, or from the inactive to the active, according to needs. In the event of trouble, the active fleet would spearhead our defense. and the inactive fleet would quickly become active and do its part. Here's the plan that would support our country's policy of preparedness against future wars. There will be two inactive fleets, one for the Pacific and one for the Atlantic. Each inactive fleet will back up an active fleet. The inactive fleet will be divided into divisions and placed at inactive fleet berthing areas. Each division will consist of ships of the same type. Large combatant vessels and certain large auxiliaries will remain in commission in reserve. That is, they'll be manned by a skeleton crew. On other vessels, all except one in each division will be out of commission in reserve. They will have no crews aboard but will be maintained by the skeleton crew of the one ship in the division that is in commission in reserve. Now, if these ships are really to back up the active fleet, they must be ready. A crew must be able to come aboard and hit the sack on the ship the very first night. The chow line must be in operation the day they come aboard. The boilers and engines must be fully assembled and ready to operate in short order. The same goes for all other machinery and electrical gear. The ship must have its full allowance of spare parts and tools and consumable supplies. Records and charts must be on board, ready for use. The hull must be in good condition. In other words, a ship in the inactive status must be practically ready to join the fleet, except for taking on a crew, ammunition, provisions and supplies that deteriorate rapidly or that are highly inflammable, like gasoline and alcohol. 
she has to be ready for shakedown in 10 days if she's in commission in reserve, 30 days if she's out of commission in reserve. That's a tall order, but a ship in the inactive status will be ready in that time if it is not allowed to go to pot while in the inactive status. And it won't do that if the Navy's plan is followed. Here's how the plan would work out in practice. The ship gets orders to be placed in the inactive status. If urgent major repairs are needed, the ship puts in at a yard. After overhaul, the ship proceeds to the designated berthing area. There, the regular crew continues to make all repairs within its ability. They inventory all equipment, tools, spare parts, and consumable supplies. They turn in all supplies that are dangerously inflammable or that are perishable on a three-year basis. And they requisition supplies needed to complete allowances. So far, all well and good. With the ship in such a condition, it could quickly be prepared for operational use if, and this is a big if, it is kept in good condition. More than any other one thing, that means protecting the ship from moisture, which causes paint to peel, steel to rust, brass, copper and bronze to tarnish, and rope and textiles to mildew and rot. So, moisture protection measures are taken by the crew under the guidance of technical men who have the know-how. Paint, the superior preservative, is applied to all surfaces where it is suitable. A rust preventive compound is put on all corrodible surfaces which cannot be painted. One grade is used on topside gear another in lubrication systems and on surfaces protected from the weather, and still another on surfaces normally in contact with water. Important topside gear is packaged with strippable film or in metal containers, and the air of the entire interior of the ship is dried and kept dry by means of what is called dehumidification. A space that cannot be opened to the interior of the ship is dehumidified by placing a drying agent called a desiccant in the space. This desiccant adsorbs moisture. Or the air can be dried by means of a dehumidification machine which circulates dry air through compartments that can readily be opened to each other. So the crew must install one or more dehumidification machines. And they must dry out the entire ship and see that it stays dry. In other words, the ship with its gear must be buttoned up tight so that it can't be damaged by moisture. When that is done, and not before, the crew can be detached. The ship is now in the inactive status and is maintained by the skeleton crew of the one ship of the division that is in commission in reserve. It is the task of these men to see that the preservative measures continue to protect the ship. If they do their job well, the ship will be ready for action whenever needed. <laughs>